Chapter twenty three of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume two, by Eliza Haywood. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three returns to Miss Betsy's adventures, from which the two former were but a digression, though a very necessary one, as will hereafter appear. If Miss Betsy had been made acquainted with the manner in which Mr. Trueworth passed his time, and the inducements he had to stay in London, doubtless her vanity would have been highly piqued, but she had not as yet this subject for mortification. On the contrary, she rather imagined he lingered here on her account, that he repented him of the letter he had sent her, though his spirit was too great to acknowledge it directly, and waited the arrival of her brother Frank, in hopes of engaging him to make his peace. With these suggestions did she please herself, whenever he came into her mind, but indeed, she had but little room for meditation on his account not only mr munden plied her close with presents treats fine speeches and all the tokens of impatient love but she had also another conquest of a more late and consequently to a young lady of her humour a more pleasing era she had been one day at her mantua makers to consult on some matters relating to her dress and was a little surprised to see the woman come the next morning before she was out of bed, to her lodgings. "'Hey day, Mrs. Modley,' cried she, "'what brings you here thus early?' "'Indeed, madam,' answered she, "'I could not well come out. I have eight or nine gowns in the house now, which should all have been finished and sent home to-day. The ladies will tear me to pieces about them, but I left all my business and run away to acquaint you with a thing you little dream of. Ah, Miss Betsy, such a fine gentleman, such a vast estate! But tis no wonder,' continued she, you are so pretty that you make all the men die for you what is it you are talking on cried miss betsy prithee dear modley explain i am so transported that i know not how to contain myself but i will tell you you were yesterday at my house sir frederick finear who lodges in my first floor the sweetest and most generous gentleman that ever lived to be sure but that is nothing to the purpose he saw you from his dining-room window when you came out of your chair and would you believe it was so struck that he immediately fell down in a swoon you were but just gone when his valet de chambre for he keeps three servants two in livery and one out came down to me and fetched me to his master oh mrs modley said he to me what angel have you got below tell me who she is if she is not already married i will give my whole estate to obtain her i ask not what her fortune is if i could once call that divine creature my wife she should command all i am worth indeed madam continued she i was so much amazed that i had not the power of speaking and he i suppose interpreting my silence as a refusal of answering his demands fell into such distractions such ravings as frightened me almost out of my wits and at last to quiet him i told him i hope you will forgive me your name and where you lived and that you were not married and on this he seemed pretty easy and i left him but about two hours after he sent for me again desired that i would go directly to you make you a declaration of love in his name and beg you to give him leave to visit you in person bless me cried miss betsy can the man neither speak nor write for himself i told him madam resumed mrs modley that it would not be well taken from me but he was quite mad would listen to no reason till i bethought myself of a stratagem which i fancy you will not disapprove i made him believe that there was no need of my going to you that you were to call upon me about a gown this afternoon that i will persuade you to stay and drink tea and he might come into the room as if by chance and entertain you with what discourse he thought proper now i would fain have you come pursued she for if you do but like his person such an offer is not to be rejected i do not regard the offer said miss betsy but i do not know that i may come just to divert myself a little that's a dear good lady cried the other about five i believe will be a proper time ay thereabout replied miss betsy but dear modley don't let him know you have spoke a word to me concerning him no no said she i shall not tell him i have seen you during the whole time this woman stayed which was indeed much longer than might have been expected from a person of that extraordinary business she pretended nothing was talked on but sir frederick finear she told miss betsy that to her certain knowledge he was of one of the best families in cornwall that he had a great estate in possession and another in reversion and besides was the next of kin to a coronet that he kept company with nothing but lords and dukes and that they were always courting his company 
though miss betsy affected to treat all she said with indifference yet she had given an attentive ear to it and after she was gone began to rummage over all her ornaments tried one and then another to see which would become her best in order to secure a victory which she imagined would afford so much triumph whether i marry him or not said she to herself the addresses of a man of his rank will make me of some consideration in the world and if ever i do become a wife i should like to be a woman of quality they may say what they will but a title has prodigious charms in it the name of finear also becomes it lady finear's servants there lady finear's coach to the door would sound vastly agreeable at the play or opera she also pleased herself with the thought that being courted by a person of sir frederick's quality and estate would immediately put to silence all the reproaches and remonstrances she might otherwise have expected to be persecuted with by her brother frank on mr trueworth's account and this imagination was of itself sufficient to give her an infinite satisfaction in fine she found so much in this new effect of her charms to elevate and delight both her vanity and convenience that she longed with as much impatience for a sight of her admirer as mrs Modley had told her he was under for a second interview with her some part of the tedious moments were however taken up in a manner she was far from expecting she was scarce risen from her toilette when word was brought her that a young lady who called herself miss flora mellison was come to wait upon her as she had never seen her since her being driven from mr goodman's the visit a little surprised her and she would have been glad if common civility had dispensed with her receiving it for though the pity she then had felt for her misfortunes had greatly effaced the memory of the injurious treatment she had met with from her yet she never desired to continue any correspondence with her after they were once parted besides she had no reason to look upon her coming as any proof of her friendship or good will but rather with a design of doing her some private prejudice she resolved to behave entirely reserved towards her her conjectures were not groundless that complication of every worst passion that can fill the human heart could not be perfectly satisfied even amidst the most unbounded gratification of her amorous desires with the man that had excited them the dread of losing him embittered all the transports of possession she very well knew he had broke off with miss betsy and doubted not but that event had happened through the artifice she had put in practice yet as there was a possibility that the adventure of denham should be unravelled and the innocency of miss betsy cleared up she trembled lest such an eclaircissement should renew all her former tenderness for that one so much love rival and herself be reduced to all the horrors of despair and shame it was therefore to sound the inclination of miss betsy that alone brought her thither in the wicked hope that if there was the least probability of a reconciliation between them she might find some opportunity of travelling all the steps that might be taken by either party for the purpose but miss betsy was too much upon her guard to give her any room to discover what her sentiments were in that point she received her very coolly and even on her first entrance told her that she was obliged to go out that evening but the other taking no notice of the little pleasure miss betsy expressed on seeing her told her she came out of friendship to visit her that she had been told mr trueworth and she were entirely parted that if she had so great an affection for him as the world had been pleased to say she must certainly stand in need of all the consolation could be given her but i hope my dear said she you have too much good sense not to despise him now nothing is more common than that men should be false remember what the poet says ingratitude's the sin which first or last taints the whole sex the catching court disease miss betsy was so provoked at being talked to in this manner that she replied that there was neither falsehood nor ingratitude in the case if mr trueworth had desisted his visits it was only because he was convinced she desired not the continuance of them tis possible these words were more galling to the jealous heart of miss flora than anything she could have said though she spoke them with no other intent than to clear herself of the imputation of having been forsaken a thing she looked upon as the worst blemish that could be cast upon her reputation miss flora finding no more was to be got out of her took her leave for this time resolving however in her own mind to keep up an acquaintance with her that seeming to her the most likely way 
both to satisfy her curiosity and prevent any effort of what the extravagance of her passion made her apprehend miss betsy did not give herself much trouble in reflecting on what miss flora had said but as soon as her watch reminded her of the appointed hour she bid her footman fly and get a chair on her coming to the house mrs Modley herself opened the door at the first rap and desired her to walk in no no said miss betsy still sitting in the chair i cannot stay i only call to tell you that i will have the silver robings put upon the green nightgown and will buy a new trimming for the pink i shall be sure to obey your orders madam replied the other but i must entreat you will do me the honour to come in and drink a dish of tea the kettle boils and i have just now had a present of a canister of some of the finest hyson in the world i must leave you then as soon as i have tasted it said miss betsy coming out of the chair for i have twenty visits to make this evening she had not been three minutes in the parlour when the person for whom all this ceremony was affected entered the room in somewhat of an abrupt manner i come mrs Modley, to complain said he my servants tell me with these words he stopped short and fixed his eyes full on miss betsy with a kind of astonishment mrs Modley, pretending to be in a great fright cried for heaven's sake sir frederick what is the matter i hope nothing in my house has given your honour any cause of complaint no no tis over now cried he your house has become a temple and this is the divinity that honours it with her presence this grecian venus miss betsy was too much accustomed to company to be easily abashed and answered briskly if you mean the compliment to me sir the grecian venuses are all painted fat and i have no resemblance of that perfection only in your face madam returned he such sparkling eyes such a complexion such a mouth in your shape you are a helen of troy that helen of troy said miss betsy with a smile i think was a grecian princess and must also be fat or she would not have been reputed a beauty there the baronet finding by this he had been guilty of an absurdity when he intended a fine speech thought to salve up the matter by saying sure you are diana then worse and worse cried miss betsy i beseech you sir compare me to no such boisterous goddess that runs up and down barefooted and bare-legged hunting wild boars in the forest what shall i call you then resumed he oh tell me by what name you will be worshipped the lady's name sir frederick cried mrs Modley hastily is miss betsy thoughtless betsy said he then betsy let it be betsy shall henceforth become more famous than cytheria was of old he was going on with his fulsome stuff in which he was often exposed by the ready wit of miss betsy when a maid belonging to the house came in and told her that a gentleman in a hackney coach was at the door and desired to speak with her with me cried she not able to guess who should have followed her there pray call my footman and bid him ask the person's name that enquires for me the maid did as she was ordered and miss betsy's servant presently after brought her this intelligence mr munden madam said he not finding you at home has taken the liberty to call on you here in order to conduct you where you are to pass the evening he must be a happy man indeed dare take such liberties cried sir frederick somewhat fiercely many take more than they are allowed to do said miss betsy go continued she to the fellow and tell him my mind is changed that i cannot leave the company i am with and will not go mr munden having received this message ordered the coachman to drive away very much dissatisfied as the reader may easily suppose miss betsy the day before had agreed to pass this evening with the ladies at st james's and some others to play at commerce a game then very much in vogue mr munden was to be one of the company and calling on miss betsy's lodgings in hopes of having some time with her before this meeting the maid who had not lived long enough with her mistress to know her humour presently told him she was only gone to her mantua makers and gave him directions to the house he also thinking it no indecorum to call on her at the house of a woman of that profession had reason enough to be mortified at the rebuff he met with for so doing as to miss betsy though she was a little angry at the freedom mr munden had taken yet she was in reality much more pleased than this for two reasons first because she saw it gave her new lover some jealous apprehensions and secondly because it furnished her with a plausible pretence for complying with his entreaties to stay which she protested she would not on any terms have been prevailed upon to do but to prevent either him or mrs Modley from suspecting she would go where mr munden had desired 
Mrs. Modley went out of the room several times, as if called away by some household affairs, that Sir Frederick might have an opportunity of declaring his passion to Miss Betsy, which he did in much the same rodomontade strain with which he had at first accosted her. A handsome supper was served in, after which she being about to take her leave, he affected to be in a great fret that a fine new chariot, which, he said, he had bespoke, was not come home, that he might have seen her safe to her lodgings, with an equipage suitable to her merit, and the admiration he had of it. He would needs, however, attend her in another chair, which piece of gallantry, after a few faint refusals, she accepted. End of chapter 23 End of the History of Miss Betsy Thoughtless, Volume 2, by Eliza Haywood